was mixing with early on in my life are now serving 20, 25 years in prison. Um, and the Lord saved me from that destiny, destruction. Um, I'm just very, very blessed to be here tonight to share my story with people. I don't know who's believers, who's not believing. Um, but what I will say to you is Jesus Christ is real. He lives. And I would not be stood here tonight if he, if, if he didn't. I'd be out there making eight grand a week, living a luxury lifestyle, if you like. That's what I thought I was living at the time. Mm -hmm. I'd be living that life. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be stood here tonight and I wouldn't be traveling around giving a testimony, uh, giving all that up if it wasn't true. What God has done for me in my life mm -hmm. is absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a book about it um, for his glory and not for any monetary purposes for me, but for kingdom money for him. That's the difference, you know. I'm not one of these preachers or, or, or evangelists that come out and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book, please everybody buy my book and then you'll see me next minute, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a nice Ferrari or whatever. That's not, what I'm doing. <laughs> That's not what it's about. It's about kingdom money for God. Um, and that book will be out when it's uh, the Holy Spirit tells me to, to finish it. So... My story starts from being a very young, young chap, um, age, six years of age, um, I was expelled from primary school. Um, I had what you call ADHD, what we know today is ADHD, and it was undiagnosed in them days, so nobody knew what ADHD was. Um, they just cast you aside. If you don't fit into our little society, and if you don't fit into uh, what we say is like, I, I, I used to call it little robots to society, if you like, and that, that's why, if you don't fit into that category, um, then, you know, you, you're cast out, simple as that. And um, I didn't, but I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea how I knew was I was getting, you know, segregated, passed from pillar to post, always been told you're naughty, you're never going to amount to anything, you you know, you're going to end up in prison, you're going to, you know, you're going to be this, you're going to be that. Uh, and that's all I ever heard from being six years of age. And then eventually, you know, when they, they expelled me at six years of age, I was then put in an approved school. And the approved school, um, it was horrendous. I was seven years of age and there was 16 year olds in this approved school. And it was chaotic. They was fighting with teachers. You'd be sat in the office one minute with your parents having a meeting, and next minute there's a teacher coming with a 16 year old pupil fighting on the floor. It, you'd pull him in the car park and they'd be on your car like monkeys, literally just pulling and trying to get in your car. It was horrendous. And that's where, that's where I started to learn how to become a, you know, a person. The character was being built on these foundations that I was being subjected to by um, the authorities. You know, they said, you must leave there, go in here, and this is where you got to stay. And my, my family said at the time, no. If you they took me out within a, a year of being there. They took me out. And then after that, I was eight years of age, and then they said, well, no school in Trafford is going to accept you. No school. So you're gonna to have to go into a boarding school, a residential school, um, and you're gonna we're gonna take you off your parents and you don't live in this residential place because nobody will accept you. So I was like, I won't be mum and dad, you know, like, I'm a I'm a I'm a baby, I'm a child, you know. I didn't have a clue what was going on, no idea. So they put me in a residential school and very quickly, I started to learn all the traits and of all these naughty boys I've been put in this school, and uh, and I started to develop a character with a label. I've already been labelled by now, so you know I'm be you know my mind is being programmed to think that I'm no good. I'm a waste of time. I'm never going to achieve anything. I'm an outcast, and all these things that I was labelled with um, started to stick. 
So I ended up in the, this boarding school, but I was very bright. I was very bright as a child and I couldn't mix well with people my own age. I'd always warm towards the, um, you know, I'd always warm towards the teachers. They were a lot older, obviously. And I'd have a full on conversation with the teacher better than I would with a child. And, and they, would, they would pick up on this. There was a few people, like my key worker, would pick up on this. And eventually they said, um, you shouldn't be in this school, man. You know, my, my uh, key worker at the time said, you shouldn't be here, Stephen. You know, you shouldn't be in this school. And she did everything they possibly could to get me out and into a mainstream school. And they fought and fought to get me into a mainstream school. And I got a chance at a school mainstream. I was 14 um, when I left the residential school. Mm. I was 14. And they gave me a chance. But when you've been, when you've been living amongst children with behavioural problems, you develop those habits traits, characteristics, because you're amongst them, you, you know, you're amongst them all, that's all you know. So they put me in a mainstream school and they say, right, we're going to put the, we're going to put you on report every day, we're going to watch everything you do to see if you behave. So the spotlight was on me as soon as I went in there. So if, if you put the spotlight on a normal child with no issues and watch them every day, you're going to find some things wrong with that child, regardless. So if you put a spotlight on a child that's just come from that environment, it's going to really highlight those those characteristics. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to work out what happens when you put you know a child in that environment and expect them to act like all the other children, like that. I got expelled after 12 months of being there. Back to residential school, they said. And I said, no. I'm not going. If you put me back, I'll run away. I'm not going back there. So they said, right, okay, we'll try another school with no guarantees, but it will try. We'll try another school. He tried it. He said, so what we'll do, we'll give you a trial period. Probationary period, three months, that's it. And if you fail it, then back to there you go. So I really tried. I tried to the point where I isolated in that school and I'd try to stay away from everybody and I really knuckled down anyway it did it worked I got away with it if you like and, and they, they accepted me into the school but it didn't take long before see what happened is I set myself up for a fail because I'd already sort of isolated so not the kids were now sort of saying oh, this kid is a naughty boy from naughty boy school the label new label there you go have another label so I'm full of labels now, and I'm only a child, you know. So what happened then was they started to, um, I started to, to get bullied a little bit, you know. People were picking on me, and they're... so I retaliate. And then I try to mix like everybody else. So I'm then trying to be somebody more to try and get the right attention. But I was thinking at that time, overcompensating really. And then one day, um, I put me on report, and that was it. Was that was the start then? You know, you started to see the characteristics really start to come out. I remember once it was, uh, and I'll never forget it. I remember the, the deputy head teacher. He, he, I went into the office, and he closed the door, and he grabbed me, and he went bang right against the wall. And he grabbed me right up like this, and I was like that. And he went, we don't want you here, Stephen. We've got to have you here. You're nothing but trouble you are. We don't want you in this place. And I just remember thinking, what? Why? What have I done? You know, I don't know. I didn't have a clue. I didn't know, you know, what they were seeing in me. I was just me. I didn't have a clue. I knew that I'd gone through the motions of, of, of these, you know, these schools, and but I just never knew what I, what it was. I just, I, I just haven't. I was like, why, why me? You know, what? I'm trying to look around, thinking, what is it that I'm doing wrong? You know, what, 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 what am I doing? 
And obviously they didn't know that ADHD was the cause of my behaviours and and so it was hidden, you know, it was hidden. I was just an outcast, like I say. So I got got to the point where I was starting to, you know, really get fed up of being told that I'm this and I'm that and I'm, I'm not. I'm not this and I'm not that, and, and, and the labels started to stick. I got fed up of it, it was really starting to get me down, and I thought, well, what do we do, you know? So I tried, I just kept trying. And then I remember one day, I was 15 years of age, and the teacher tried to, he said, come up to the, the, the front, Stephen. I'm going to speak to you in front of the class. And she tried to embarrass me in front of the whole class. She was asking me questions. I wasn't able to concentrate, so I didn't remember what she was talking about. And she tried to make a fool of me. And um, people were laughing because I was trying, and I really, really fell in. And she says, go and sit down, silly boy. And I sat, and then I sat there and I was just playing. She went, what are you doing? Get to the office, get to the office. And I, and I thought, something just went bang. I had for this, you know, really, that was it. That was the, the, the final straw. And I stood up and I said, no. I said, I'm done. She went, get to that office. And I said, I won't tell you what I said, but I said, I'm sure you were mad. You can imagine I wasn't very happy. But I picked my bag up and I walked down the corridor and I went, I went home and I said, I'm never going back to school again. I was 15. I knew it was too late to send me back to the, the residential because you're out at 16 anyway and I was just in just 15 and a bit so I thought I'm not going back and it was the most liberating feeling I've ever had as a child walking down that corridor knowing that I'm not going back to school this is it it's the end and within three months of me leaving that school I was on a plane to Tenerife where I then started to work in timeshare. I'm sure you've been approached by a timeshare. Some of you might have bought one now <laughs> over the years. Um, as you may know, it is a con. And, you know, people were selling apartments and making money out of it, selling weeks and months and in the same room over and over and over again until there was no months left in the year. Um, and, and a lot of them, you know, it was, it was a scam and things like that. So I was one of the people on the streets that used to get you into the, 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 the resort to look around for an hour and I'd come up to you on the street and I'd give you a, a lucky dip and I'd say one for you, sir, one for you. And there'd be a piece of paper in the middle and there'd, there'd be holidays in one side of the lucky dip and then the big champagne and maybe um, you know a t-shirt or whatever in the other. So they didn't see me move, move the piece of paper, you know. When, so the holiday, you won the t-shirt, the, the, the champagne, and then we'd come to you, or if it was three of you, or whatever, someone would get the holiday and you go, oh my gosh, you won the holiday, fantastic. You've got to go and collect it now. And that would be the con. Get you down there, agree to an hour, to look around the resort and you get your prize at the end and then I get paid if you agree to do the resort. And after that time, obviously, then you would be with pressure sales and then you know, they'd, try, they'd, they'd try and sell you a liner, what they'd call a liner, would try and sell you the, the apartment. So I was into that, as, I got into that very, very early. So I fitted into that role brilliantly because, you know, um, my character was very colourful at a very early age and I, I learned a lot of sort of tricks um, and, and I'm warm to it because that was the way I was, you know, that was, I thought, wow, this is, this is great, this, you know, making money and, you know, and, and I'm just, I'm just lying my way through it all, you know, and, and, and putting a performance on, you know, and, and making money. And those people that I was meeting with over there at that age, again, it was either people on the run, it was drug dealers, it was all sorts of walks of life that I was mixing with over in, in Tenerife at the time. And, um, I was driving a car illegally over there. I was living in an apartment at 16. I've got a child now, he's 16. To think that he's just a child at 16 still, you know, the, his mentality. And I look at him and I think, wow, you know, I was living abroad, smoking cannabis, cigarettes and drinking and doing all sorts of madness at that age, you know. I was an adult, but really I was a ch child, you know, and uh, hurting with a lot of pain wrapped up, you know, covered up by 
by drinking and doing everything else. And, but at the same time, I was free from that label. I was free to do what I wanted to do and not be told I'm no good. And, and I felt like I had, like, you know, I was gay somewhere because I had something to prove, see. So when I left on that school, I said, I'm going to show every single one of you people what I am and what I'm going to be. And I'm going to prove every one of you wrong. And I, it, the, the, the strength of that was so strong and propelled me in life to be successful. I wanted to be successful so badly to prove these people wrong because I was, I was going to show these guys who was who and what I'm capable of. Um, and obviously I had no qualifications when I left school. And I thought, I'm going to show you, I don't need them. So when I went out there and started making money, I was making in excess of 500 quid a week. I mean, back in them days, you know, that's a lot of money for a, for a 16 year old boy, a lot of money. You know, so I'm mixing with these people, I'm mixing with these gangsters, drug dealers, and then I start selling a bit. I mean, I'll make a few quid extra here, start selling a bit of cannabis. So I start meeting the drug dealers, then you start selling a bit of cannabis. And then after a while, it's very seasonal where in with timeshare. So you might go to the Canaries, it's hot all, all year round. You'll go to, you know, where, then you might island hop. So you'll go over uh, to, to ten of them, Lanzarote, or you'll go over to mainland Spain. Mainland Spain is seasonal, should I say, not the, they, they have a, lot, a bit of rain, so then when it starts to rain there, you'll go to the Canaries and you'll just island hop and work for different resorts. And that's what I did. For, for a good few years and eventually I started to meet people who were really really serious criminals then you know um, who were over there selling not only just selling it but bringing it in from different countries and things like that um, so I started to think well, I, I, I want to be like this guy he's driving you know the Porsche he's got the jewelry he's got the women he's got the clothes he's got the swagger wow I love this I want that I want to be like him, you know, and, and, and that is what I had, that, that, my mentality then was, I'm going to be somebody and I want to be like him, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, that's just because of the way I grew up, it was, it's like, question yourself now, you are who you are, mm -hmm. yeah, so you try and, you, somebody tries to tell you to act differently than who you are now, you, you just, you don't know any different because this is who you are. And it's only Jesus that can change who you are. Mm -hmm. You don't know how, you, you're only you because this is who you are, yeah? So I was only him because that's all I ever knew. I didn't know anything, I didn't question anything, that is me. What is it to question? You don't question your lives now of who you are. I know that some of you are in Jesus, and but what I'm trying to say is you don't question who you are until Jesus comes into your life and changes who you are. And that is, that's the only reason why I was able to change. Mm -hmm. Now, after a while over in, you know, in, in, in Spain and wanting to be this character and trying to, I was then meeting different people and taking little bits of character off different people. I like the way he swaggers. I'll have a bit of that. I like the way he's confident in that. Head. I'll have a bit of that. So I started to develop a character then and I was, I was molding myself with these characters that I was trying to be somebody and this is, I'm gonna make my, myself into somebody. And that's what I was doing for a long time. Eventually I went back to, to see in, in, in Spain and in that industry, you're a weekend millionaire. So all your money, oh, at the weekend, it gets blown. And on women, drugs, alcohol, all the wrong things. You spend it and it just comes easy come and it's easy go. And, uh, and that's what it was for me for a long time. And then I went over to the, to, the, to the UK and I didn't have very much money when I came back to the UK. I moved into my mother's flat at the time and she'd met another, she'd met a guy and she was living with him and she, was, she, she said, well, well, I've got this flat, you may as well stay in there. So I was there for a while. And I was in the local pub. I remember meeting this guy and he was the local drug dealer. But he was very, very big drug dealer. And his family, his brother, and his network of people, they were, they were very, very high up. So they used to import the drugs into the country and then sell them in a big way to other big drug dealers. So they said to him, well, this guy said to him, do you want to make some extra money? 
I said, yeah, he says, how about, you've got a, you know, you, you live on your own. I said, yeah, yeah, he says, we want you to look after some stuff for us, be a safe house. How, do you, how, how, how does that sound? So I thought, well, listen, I've got no money coming in, you know, spent most of it, no, no, no qualifications. What am I going to do? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll do it. So next minute, they're bringing a hundred kilo bales of, of cannabis into the house. I said, look after that. So, yeah, no problem. Put it in. Boom. And then I, I thought, uh, you know, instead of paying me in, in cash, why don't you pay me in the product? Because I thought, well, I'll make more money out of it that way. Yeah, that'll work for me. He gets it cheaper. I can pay me the cash and I can sell it and make more money. So that's what he did. He gave me a bit, he gave me, you know, in, in the product, and that's what I started to do. I started to sell it and make more money. And then he said to me, How about looking after something else as well? I said, What's that? How about looking after some cocaine? Allegedly, by the way, this is all allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, um, Nah. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. A big time in that, I don't want to do that. I said, um, no, I don't want to do it. All right. Then he asked me again. He said, listen, how about, <clears throat> I'll give you 500 quid a week to look after it. I said, okay. Yeah. No problem. I thought, 500 quid a week? I'm not doing anything. Right. 500 quid a week for that. And that. I'm going to be on a few quid. You know, happy days. I'll stick it in the back of the telly. That's what I did. So I unscrewed the telly, and the big bats on the telly, stuck it in there. Nobody knows any different. You know, I'll put, um, you know, I'll put, put the TV on, sit there and watch it. No, no one will know the difference. And that's what I did for a little bit. And then I started saying, Do you, I'll tell you what, give it us in product now. Give us the coke, give us the coke and I'll start selling a bit of it. No problem. So he starts giving it me cocaine. So then I start chopping it up and I start selling it. And then I start getting around. People know me. I'm net mixing with these big boys then. So now I'm getting a bit of a face for selling stuff. So then they're coming to me for, 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 for the cannabis and they're coming to me for the coke and I'm starting to make a few quid. I'm starting to feel good because you know I'm getting recognised with the boys. So I'm feeling confident. Then I start dressing a bit smart and spending a few quid on myself. And then I thought I need a car and they're giving me a nice BMW to drive around in. Wow, you know. I'm, I'm living life now. This is this is great. This is great. You know, I thought I was living the life, but there was always a hole. I'm thinking at the time I was just you just there was always that something not right. You know, still not not quite right. Even though I thought, yeah, this is great. You know, this is great. And the hole started to get bigger and bigger and bigger as as time went on. And What happened then was I started to grow and I started to then say, this isn't enough, this, I'm better than this. So I started to listen then to, to how you manufacture, allegedly manufacture these drugs with myself. So I'm thinking, right, okay, how do I, I start asking questions then. How do you do, how do you press that stuff? How do you make that into how do you make that ounce into five ounces? I'll, I'll, so I start to find out how to do it. I start to find out how to manufacture it and make five times more money than, than the product cost. So if I pay a thousand pound for an ounce of cocaine and I sell those ounces then for 700 each, a lot of money, a lot of money, you know? So. That's what I started to do. I started to find people and started, then I started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And before long, people were coming to me and they would, you know, they was buying ounces, half kilos. I was getting big. I started to develop a character. I started to find this person who I always wanted to be, this, 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 this white boy with all these bits that I took off everybody and the swagger and the clothes and the Rolex and the, the flash car and the I'm better than everybody else now this is me this is who I am and you know 
up yours to everybody that ever doubted me because this is what I've become. You said I was going to fail. You said I was never going to achieve anything. You said I was, I was I'm a nobody. Well, look at me, I'm a somebody. That's what I said to myself, you know, that's what I was saying out. I was screaming out. The clothes were screaming out. The car was screaming out, all this. But there was still a hole. There was still a hole. The hole was getting bigger. I couldn't understand it. Thinking, why? What's going on? Why, why, why don't I feel amazing? Why is this still this something? It must be, I need more. I must need more. That's what it is. I'm going to go higher. I'm still not done yet. I must, I need more. So time went on and I started to grow and I started to, things started to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And before, you, before long, I'm mixing with serious underground gangsters. The underworld at its best, you know. I'm not going to mention names, but you will see them in books and you'll see them on the news and you'll see them in newspapers and you'll see that these people um, are serious, serious criminals in the underworld. Mm -hmm. And I started to mix with these across the country. Um, the, the, it got that to that point, you know, allegedly I was mixing with millions of pounds with, 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 of drugs um, through syndicates and networks. Um, allegedly I was selling weapons and anything to make money, to gain hierarchy position to be a feared individual so nobody had messed with him i was trying to mold myself into this big boy that i thought was going to be untouchable because i really wanted to get to the top of my game this is what i really wanted this is where i really this was my this was my focus this is my forte i'm gonna do it i'm gonna make it i'm doing it and allegedly I was making in excess of £40,000 a month off the cocaine round and whatever else came at the side of it, you know. I was driving around in all the best cars you can imagine, Mercedes, Porsches, I was flying all over the world, I was staying in hotels, £12,000 for two weeks. I was living it like you wouldn't believe. There was still this hole that I couldn't fill. And I thought, you know, I just want, you know, at this point in my life, I thought, this is who I am, this is who I want to be, you know, I thought I'd made it, I thought this is it, I've made this, this is, this is who, I've become somebody, and you know, but there was, there was still more, I wanted to get bigger, I wanted to, I really wanted to grow and grow and grow, and I haven't got all night, so I will condense the rest of it, now, at that point, something happened, and there was, there was a lot of money involved in the situation. And I put a lot of money into something that was supposed to be coming from a certain place to a certain place. And it got caught. And there was a lot of people throughout the country had had on, had put money into this syndicate. And it got caught and there was issues and there was a lot of money went missing and lost. And I was in the thick of it. And I had people who wanted to take my life for it and it, it, it ended up, um, I didn't want to run, I was on the run, I didn't want to stay either, so I didn't really know what to do, I thought what am I going to do, right, so I thought well I'm just going to, I've got this guy on the phone to me saying, rah, 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 rah. who are you talking to, you're not getting anything now pal. Bad mistake. Because then, you know, he's got guys looking for me. Then this guy's a gangster in Marbella, and next minute I've got guys looking for me to do me in. And um, it wasn't good. The situation wasn't good, you know. So what am I going to do? So this time, there's a, the, the, I don't know any of you know Dave Riley. There may be a few. He's the president of my chapter in, um, in Warrington. His son was going out with my sister at the time, and um, he'd seen me pulling up and in these flash cars and the swagger and all this. And can you look after this? And I'd go in literally with a carrier bag full of money. I'd say, Can you watch that for me? Look after it for me and all that. And, and um, he did. And, and, and he said to me one day, he 
He said, do you know, he says, my dad's a police officer. Say no more, mate, don't want to know. And told me I'm not interested. He said, oh, no, he's not that kind of police officer. Oh, yes, he is. He said, I won't have to tell me what kind of police officer. I know what he is. He went, no, no, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. He said, and he helps people like you. He said, he won't be able to help me. I said, don't be telling him either. Don't be telling him anything about me, please. He went, no, I won't do. But he says, look, you know, if you ever need to reach out to him, please reach out to him because he'll help you. All right, yeah, no problem. <coughs> okay. And it just so happened, he said, I thought, Christian, well, I don't know what happened. But what happened was then, I, I, he invited me for a dinner. He, he said to me, he did mention me to him. <laughs> he did mention me to him. So he invited me to this dinner. I said, no, no, I don't. It's a free, free course meal. Just come along. What have you got to lose? Just come along. All right. Okay, I was feeling quite low at the time. I said, oh, you know what, I'll go along. So I went to a FGB dinner, and there was a guy called Mowin on at this dinner. And um, he was preaching. So I'm sat there and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, I'll be up, you know, get me dinner and then I'm off. And then he started saying, Who wants a new life? So. Who wants to change? Who wants to be forgiven? So I'm starting to put my head up a little bit more and a bit more. Everything you've ever done and everything anyone you've ever hurt, anything you've ever done, the worst you can imagine you'll be forgiven tonight. You'll have a new life, you'll have a new spirit inside you and your mind will be transformed. And that is a guarantee. All you've got to do is put your hand up now. Who wants that? Of course I want it, you know, I put my hand up for that. Absolutely I want it. So I just put my hand up like that and he went, that's a bold move. The best decision you'll ever make in your life. And he said, come to the front. <laughs> so I didn't sign up for this, you know what I mean? I signed up for three course dinner for free. I didn't sign up for getting up. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, so he said, come to the front. I'd like to pray for you. Oh, here we go. You know, I thought... You know, all right. So I stood at the front. So he started praying for me. Next minute, I'm on me back on the floor. And I'm going, and I've just, but I'm feeling like I've just been knocked out. <laughs> I feel peace though. You know, it's not like I feel this peace. I'm on me back. But then I thought, this is a cult, this. Straight away, I'm thinking, this is a cult. What's going on? Why am I on the floor? This is crazy. So as soon as I thought this is a cult, Dave Riley has come over the top of me. And this is, this is in my mind, right? This is in my mind. This is a cult. Dave Riley leans over, he goes, Steve, this isn't a cult. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read my mind? <laughs> and that's what I thought. And, and, but, but afterwards, I realised it wasn't that. I thought, wow, I feel amazing. I feel peace. All that trouble of being threats of my life, being all that madness going on in my head, and oh, I was in a bad way, you know, with all this madness. You can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine. And I don't think you've ever, if you've ever been in a situation where your life's being threatened, or people looking for you want to take you out, and you're in a load of, you know, you're in a lot of money's worth of debt. I won't go into how much, but I'll, I'll, it's a lot. And I feel this peace. And it's all gone. That's gone. And I'm like, wow, wow. So I thought, wow, okay. So he said, look, Steve, it's the Holy Spirit. He says, it's inside you now. You give your life to the Lord. And, and, and he said, just you need to say this sinner's prayer. And I said, this sinner's prayer. And I said, then, I'm on fire. I felt great. And it lasted about two weeks, this feeling of walking on air. It was amazing. I never felt anything like it in my life set free what they told me was set free and I thought wow this is unbelievable and I started to walk in that then I was starting got me a church and I started to go to church and I started to feel good and but there's still still a lot of money owing and there's still a lot of carnage and I don't listen I'm not going to tell you what or what I believe or if it was God, I'm not going to say that because it's very controversial. But I've put it this way. 
miraculously, I come across something that was um, a product that I came across, a pro allegedly, I came <laughs> across a product, I came across a product that was a, a cleaning agent that you could mix with cocaine to make more, it was a, it was a, it was a bash, what you call a bash, and you put it in with, to make more. So I thought, oh, it's not selling drugs. So what I'll do is I'll open a, I'll open a cleaning business and I'll start selling that to the drug dealers to get out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. And I found this product and I, I, was, I, was, buying, I was buying it for £90 a drum and I was selling it for £32,000 a drum. <laughs> I was soon out of debt, and I was like, what's going on, that's unbelievable, I can't believe I've just got out of all this debt, and it's like, I paid it off with, like that, and, and some, and a lot, you know, on the side, and I think, what that did to me, did it, it, instead of me going, right, that's it, I'm away from this now, I started to get pulled again. It could have been Satan trying to take me in and go, right, I've got rid of all you, but now we'll keep you in, keep you in. I don't know, but I know that when I did start to try and do dodgy stuff again, before it was easy, absolutely not a problem. I did whatever you want me to do, um, it's fine. But I was, I was, I, I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't sell something without going, I feel terrible. I feel like I've just killed somebody. Not that I've ever killed anybody by the way. I thought, this is, it's not, how come I feel so convicted for this? And I was really convicted for anything, the smallest thing, you know, I was convicted of it. I thought, this, I just I can't feel, it's something not right, you know? And I was being convicted of everything. Before long, it got very, very hard to live doing things wrong. It just got really difficult, you know, and I thought, and I obviously spoke to a few Christians, and you're being convicted by the Spirit, this isn't your know, water, you're a new creation. You need to be baptised, and you need to go, you'll be forgiven of it all, the old will die, you'll be resurrected, and you've got to walk in that. Okay, let's do it. So I was, I was baptised, and I went out, and I tried again. Now, I did go to church and I did do a lot of them, but I still had one foot in, one foot out, and I still thought I could do it my way. Didn't steal, didn't sell drugs, didn't do anything like that. I completely walked away from that, but I did, there were still characteristics that were sticking. There were still things that wasn't quite right, but the main stuff had been taken away and cut out of my life. And I decided to walk away from that life, and I decided to walk away from all the money and all the material stuff that I had. I walked away from it all and I decided to follow Jesus. But I wanted a bit more proof. I wanted a little bit more proof about this Jesus guy because, you know, all right, you made me feel like this, but so does cocaine. It makes me feel good. So does money. So do, but I started to realise this hole that I couldn't fill was being filled with Jesus. I thought, wow, well, that, that, that it's worth way more than any money or any anything. This this feeling, this I'm liberated. And I I'm talking about being set free from from drink, alcoholism, drug addiction. I was set free. I felt amazing. I felt a new person, a new man. All my head, all my full of madness was just clear and taken away. I thought this is absolutely incredible. This is real. This this is this this is nothing but Jesus Christ. <coughs> so I started to test the Lord. Don't ever do this, by the way. I'm not going to tell you to do it because everybody, you know, it's not the right thing to do. It says in the Bible not to test the Lord, you know. But me being me, uh, God knew my character. He let me off a bit. Because, you know, he, he, I think he needed to, I think he thought, well, you know what, go on, I'll, I'll let you off, because you need to see it. You've had a bit of a tough time, kid. I'll, I'll let you off. And that's what he did. So I started to put him to the test a little bit. Now, 
I'm telling you now, this is the best bit. That is, I mean, that stuff, that's all demonic. That's all horrible lifestyle. The money, the women, the drugs, all that madness is all demonic. It's Satan with his spirit in me, guiding me to destruction, to take me soul and bury it for eternity with him. That's what the plan was. That's what was, the, the, that was the plan, the main plan. And I got free from it. Jesus set me free from that. Mm -hmm. And you know, when it, uh, things started to happen, and so the first thing was, was my niece. She was, she had leukemia. She was, she, she, she was 13 years of age. She was diagnosed with leukemia. It was devastating for the family, absolutely devastating. And what we, I remember saying, well, we'll pray for her. So I'm this new Christian, you know, we'll pray for it, it's all right. So I'm in the room and they're saying, I'm sorry, you, you know, you, your daughter's been diagnosed with leukemia and, and my, my sister is shaking, she's in, she's rocking and she's, oh my, she's in a state of shock. My dad's like this and I'm like, it's all right, we're going to be okay, Jesus is in, in charge. And they also thought, this guy's lunatic, you know, <laughs> you know but I, I'm saying, it's all right, it's going to be okay. And God must have thought, wow, that kid's got some faith. He must have looked down and gone, yes, that's the faith I want to see. Because I called Dave, it's, it's crazy because it's, we asked her, I said, Maddie, what do you want? She sat in the bed, what do you want, sweetie? You can have anything you want, what do you want? She went, I want Dave to come and pray for me. Wow, wow, absolutely. Called Dave up and said, Can we do this biblically, Dave? Come and pray for her, lay hands on her, and anoint her. She wants you to come down and do it. He said, Absolutely. He came down, prayed for her, went through the motions, laid hands on her, anointed her with oil. She started to get better. And she got better and better and better. And then something happened. She got these ulcers in her mouth and they started to spread. And it was going up to the brain and it could have killed her. They said, this is a side effect from the chemotherapy. Unfortunately, it can be fatal. And I'm like, you're not having that, mate. I'm not having that. My Jesus is going to heal her. So that's what I'm saying. <coughs> so I said, right, okay. So I laid hands on her myself and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command these ulcers to fall away and die in her mouth right now. And within two days, she was spitting cops of these these um, ulcers out in this tissue, they all fell out. Praise God. She's free from cancer today, she's in remission, and she's walking free from cancer. Oh, that was the miracle that I seen, the first miracle yeah. I seen that Jesus did. After that, my dad got Luke, uh, my dad got diagnosed with prostate cancer. I was devastated. I remember falling to my knees in the garden. Please, please God, don't take me dad. Please don't let him die. Say, say show me your power. Show me what you can do. And you know, I, I was sat there reading the Bible and the Lord just showed me. The Lord put herbs and spices, fruit and veg to heal the body. I said, Jesus, what do I need to give him? And then I was looking at something else and Ginger just jumped right off the page. It was as if he just magnified it, had to magnify it. It went, Pff. It was like something out of, like, you know, you see on telly where you see this. It, it was like that. It was literally like that. And I just knew. The spirit inside of me said, it's ginger. I need to give him ginger. So I said, Dad, I've got to give you ginger. He had a biopsy. Four weeks. I said, you're taking three grams of ginger every day for four weeks, Dad. And I just naked it. And he's, and he's like, he's really having a bad time trying to get this down. Him. And I said, it's all right. You're going to be all right, Dad. You've got to get this down yeah." Four weeks later, he went for a biopsy and 48 samples were taken and every single cancer cell was dead. Oh, Everyone. He was in the room, five people in the, in the cubicles next to him. Every single one of them had cancer. Sorry, Mr. Jones, it's cancer. Sorry, Mr. Smith, it's cancer. You know, right to, me, to the end, to my dad, and he said, Brian, you've, you've not got cancer. And I knew Jesus had saved him. Jesus had set him free. And it was, it was, and you know that the Lord, the Lord does things and he allows things. And you know, the, the doctor, he said, what have you done? You know, he was, he was, he was baffled by, I said, I put my dad on ginger. I said, and it's the ginger that's, that's cured him. And he went, 
he looks at me as if to say, you know, you're crazy. My dad stopped taking the ginger and the cancer came back. And we went back to the, to the consultant, Mr. Sinclair, he was called. I said, he stopped taking his ginger. I said, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put him back on the ginger and his PSA levels are going to drop and he'll be, he'll be, his cancer's going to go because he's not took his ginger. He says, well, I'll tell you what, if, that, if you put him on ginger and his cancer goes, he said, I'm putting all my patients on ginger. <laughs> That's what he said. Right. He went back on the ginger and the cancer went, boom. I went back and I went, told you. <laughs> he went, Brian, stay on the ginger. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Because that, see, God wants to make sure his, his message is heard and he, people, he wants people to know it's that. Because some people can doubt, you know, if we make sure sometimes you let things slip and he'll go, right, let's let him have it back and then go back and, and we'll make the message uh, double strong the next time. And that's what he did. And you know what I can tell you now, uh, you know, after that, the next one was me, my niece again, unfortunately, the poor kid had a horrific car accident. She'd been through leukemia, nearly lost her life. Um, thought she was going to die. Hit, she hit three at 50 miles an hour. She, she was uh, in Middlesbrough <coughs> with a boyfriend driving the car. And she was airlifted to hospital. She died on arrival. She was in a coma for three weeks. She had um, a horrendous, she broke her ribs, fractured her jaw, broke her fingers, fractured skull, bleed on the brain, burst bowel, broken back. She was, she was, she was gone. She literally resuscitated and said 50-50, she's, she's not gonna make it, you know. Devastated, everybody absolutely devastated. Now. Again, I, I said, Let's, we're going to do this biblically. We need to do this biblically. We lay hands on her, we're going to anoint her, we're going to do it exactly as we've done it before because I've got faith she can live. And that's what we did. We did it biblically. And right the way through it, the Lord was speaking to me, only me, and I was telling everybody in the family what, what, what was going to happen. And he even said, the Lord said she's going to get sepsis, and, but she's going to come through it. And she got sepsis and he said, it's really looking bad, you know, the, all these antibiotics, the, the antibodies now, it's, it's turned on her. I said, no, Dad, Dad, sisters, <laughs> the Lord has said that this is going to happen and it's not going to happen, so don't worry. And that's exactly what happened. She got through it. And this is where God shows up and makes sure people know that God shows up. When, when she was going down for all these operations, it was every one of them was successful. The burst in the bowel, she, she went down, it was a few issues and then it was okay. But the big one was the one where they said, look, you know, she's, she's possibly going to be paralysed because she's broke her back. So this, we prayed and there was a, there was a surgeon supposed to be doing, <laughs> this only God can do this, it's amazing, I love it. The surgeon that was supposed to be working on the back, he, he, he ended up changing Got, something happened. So this other guy took his place and lo and behold he's a Christian. <laughs> and so he, he worked on the back and he was an absolute success and he came back and he said we thank you so much but he went that wasn't me working, that was my, not my hands, that's God's hands. Wow! You know these are the miracles that I've seen. I wouldn't be still here tonight telling you this. I'd be still doing what I was doing, living that reckless lifestyle, and not, not, you know, making all that money. But people think he's living, by the way, nowadays, which is not. I'd be doing all that. I wouldn't be still here tonight telling you this story. I really wouldn't. I wouldn't be living a Christian life if it wasn't true, what I'm talking about. I've seen miracles after miracles after miracles. And I've tested God because I needed to see it for myself. And he didn't have to tell me. Yes, I'll do it for you. He didn't have to do those things for me, but he did. And the last one I'll tell you about, which is very, I could go on. You know, Dave Riley, uh, Jeanette, his wife said, I have never known anybody to have every prayer answered like you. <laughs> but I've never known anybody to have so much trauma at the same time. You know, after miracles, after miracle, after miracle, after miracle, it's just unreal. But it must be my faith that I have in God. You know, I, I, you know, he doesn't favour anybody, but
But it's all, if you look in the Bible, it's all about faith and belief. If you have that faith, it's small as a mustard seed. And if you believe and ask, and truly believe, ask of anything in my name and it'll be done. It was done because that faith I had, you do it. Now, my mother, she, she had, she had um, an illness and she's on dialysis. She still is, by the way. Um, and she flatlined multiple organ failure, heart attack, everything collapsed. And she was in intensive care, she was in a coma, and they said, they've got me in my system in the room, he says, I'm so, really sorry, but it's not good, and she's not gonna make it through the night. And my sister collapsed, and she's in a bad way. But I said, no. So I looked at the doctor and said, no, she, she's not, she is gonna make it. Look at my face, you're gonna witness a miracle. Remember who I am. Remember this face. You're going to witness a miracle. He said, it's always nice to have hope. I said, this isn't hope. Remember who I am. Dave, come and do this job again, please, buddy. <laughs> and we need, we need you to lay hands and do, do this biblically as usual. Please come down to the hospital and pray for me, Mum. Absolutely. He came down to the hospital. He anointed her. He prayed for her. And he, and he said, the word of God came to him like that. Bam! And he came out and he said, he said, Stephen, the Lord's spoken to me. Your mum's going to have a dramatic turnaround within two hours. Within two hours, she was off the ventilator, breathing by herself. Mm. Life's vital signs all come back. And she sat up. <laughs> and the doctor, I rem remember this doctor walked past like that and he went. <laughs> <laughs> you should be dead. <laughs> no, no, no. See, this is where Jesus steps in. This is where the Lord steps in. Now, we, we can believe whatever we want, but if you really believe what that Bible says and you really put your heart and soul into Jesus Christ, you will see miracles. If you want to live this life of misery and pain and, 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 and trudging all the time and, and not feeling whole and all the things of the world, if you want to be in misery every day, crack on living it because that is, you're given free will to do it. You can do whatever you want to do, but the second you turn around and go, I'm sick and tired of living like this, I don't want to live like this anymore. And if all I've got to do is ask the Lord to see, to reveal himself to me, to see if he's real, if that's it, what, you know, what, is that hard work? Is that, what, what is that? Is that hard work? Just to say, reveal yourself to me, Lord, and I'll follow you. Because that's all it takes. And he will do. And he will set you free from any alcohol problems, any misery. And do you know what? I, I, I've had everything. And the Lord has stripped me of everything that I've had. Do you know I'm not one of these Christians that you see still driving around in the flash cars and all that lot who have still got the legal, legal money, been stripped of it all. And he started me off because the Lord said to me, I'm going to have to strip you of everything because it all belongs to Satan. Mm -hmm. And I can't bless you if, unless you are stripped of everything mm -hmm. and, and then the, I'll bless you. So I've had to lose everything. And now he's rebuilding my life and giving me a new life, a new heart, a new mind. I'm, I'm filled with love, joy and happiness and peace. Mm -hmm. I'm not living in sin. I'm not living in that head. You know, that, that unsatisfied head and that wanting to look for material things to fill a gap or some temporary happiness, temporary happiness in a drink, or temporary happiness in a bit of drugs. And then I feel horrible after it wears off and you don't want to be here and praying to die. Been through it, done it all. Didn't want to be here, wanted to die. I've done it, I've, I've, I've done the lot. I've been in the more pain than you could ever imagine, that you could ever imagine through alcohol and, and drug addiction. Wanting to pray, please just take me, I've had enough, Lord. I've been through all that misery and the Lord set me free from it all. And you know what he's done for me? He's, he's not only set me free, but now, my dad's been set free, he's a Christian. My mum's been set free, she's a Christian. My sisters have been set free, they're Christian. So, as it says, he'll set the whole household free. Yes, His word is true, and you would not believe the people he set free in my family. And the saved, I know where I'm going today. When I die, 
If I die tomorrow, I'm going to heaven, I've got eternal life, and I know because I've seen what he does for my family and what he does for me, and the way I feel, and the way I think, and everything about me today, I feel the Lord, I feel the peace of the Lord inside of me. And you know what, I wouldn't give it up for a billion dollars, because it's not worth a carrot to me, because I've had it all. I can tell you now, I've had bundles, and I've lived the life that you couldn't imagine, and I felt empty. I haven't got very much today. At the moment, the Lord's promised me he's going to re-prosper me and he's going to give me everything back that I've lost. But I've got to go through a refining. And he's still refining me and I'm still going through it. But I'm, I'm happier than I've ever been. I'm happier than I've ever, ever been. So if there's anybody here tonight that has not got Jesus in the life, and you're living this mundane life and you're cracking on through the motions of life and you're trudging on, and you think, is this it? No, it's not. It's not it. If you want it to be, carry on. But if you listen to me tonight and you say, you know what, I want freedom. I want to be set free. I want that peace and happiness and serenity and joy. I want to have what these people have got. And all you've got to do is say a prayer and surrender. End of story. And the Lord will come into your life and he'll change everything. Whatever you do, do not go back or try and think you can have one foot in, one foot out. Because you're never one foot in, one foot out. You're only ever two feet in with Satan. There's only one way and that's the Lord's way. So don't ever go back. Because some, you know, the Lord has blessed me and he's allowed me to come out of that. Some people go back and never get back. They're swallowed up by the world. You know, ask yourself this question. If you're not saved tonight and you die tomorrow, you are going to hell for eternity. There is no going back. So, while you have the opportunity, you are here for a reason tonight, listening to this message. You either take it, because the Lord says he will give everybody an opportunity. Everybody an opportunity. If you don't take it, that's it. it may, you may not get another opportunity after tonight. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody does. I know where I'm going tomorrow. Do you? So, if there's anybody that wants prayer tonight, be bold like I was. And there's nobody who was like me that, you know, felt embarrassed and thought I was better than everybody. I, I thought, you know, what, I've got to try, I've got to do this. And I walked up and I gave my life to the Lord and I just put my hand up. If that's, if, you know, take my belief out of my book tonight. Forget about, you know, is your life better now, are you living a fantastic life of peace, happiness, joy, serenity? Because if you're not, you can have it. And it, all it takes is just to reach out. And you will change, and your mind will change, and your heart will change, your life will change. And when you pray into your life, the Lord will open doors like you've never believed He will open. And it'll set you completely free. And I'm here tonight to give testimony that that is true. And He does live. And the more you lean into him, you, the more he will reveal himself to you. And you will know that Jesus Christ is real. He lives, he's a real God, and heaven is real, and so is hell. So I invite you tonight, if you want prayer, come over to me. I'll pray for you. If you've got any illnesses, ailments, whatever, come over. I'll pray for you. And let the Lord have all the glory, because he deserves every bit of it. Thank you for coming and listening to me tonight. All glory be to God. Amen. Amen.